So folks, I'm going to pause that recording. We'll also get a recording after, John, so that's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, feel free to uh, put any questions into the chat if, uh, if you get stuck on anything. Uh, the slides, as I mentioned, are accessible at this bit.ly link. Um, so that's been pasted into the chat. Uh, so Start Small is joined today by John Jay College Institute for Justice and Opportunity. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, representatives from there. A uh, brief introduction, uh, Jamila Diaz is the Director for Career Pathways Program bridging the worlds of workforce development, higher education, and criminal justice reform. Career Pathways prepares people for successful careers in human services and community justice. Before joining the Institute, Jamila worked with the South Bronx Overall Economic Development Corporation, or SOBRO, as the Assistant Vice President of Community and Economic Development. During her tenure, she worked on projects in collaboration with the city, state, and federal governments that provided opportunities to disadvantaged neighborhoods throughout Bronx and Manhattan. I uh, also want to introduce uh, John Molina, who's mentoring and uh, alumni coordinator at the Institute. For over a decade, John has advocated for higher education for those who've been impacted by the criminal legal system. John earned a Bachelor of Science in Health Services Administration with presidential honors from Lehman College in 2010. John went on to enroll at uh, New York University's Wagner School of Public Service, where he earned a Master of Public Administration with a specialization in health policy and management. Uh, John is also an active member of ALPHA, uh, the Association of Latino Professionals for America. So I am going to turn it over to uh, our representatives uh, from there. Really very uh, proud to, to be able to uh, bring you this content and partner with uh, with John Jay College Institute for Justice and Opportunity. Uh, Jamila. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Anne, for those wonderful introductions. Um, I'm just going to go briefly over our mission here at the Institute for Justice and Opportunity. And John and I are also going to go briefly over some of the programs that we think you may be able to take advantage of or spread the word. Um, but our mission is we see ourselves as the champions for institutional, structural, and personal transformation. We try to eliminate barriers for people who have been involved with the criminal legal system. Um, and we create access to higher education and to uh, career pathways, helping those that have been affected by the legal system with housing, employment, healthcare, and most of all, human rights. Uh, their human rights uh, when it comes to uh, their legal involvement. And so the college initiative is, is a college access program. And it's uh, also a community of students that have, uh, or formerly incarcerated or have been impacted by the criminal legal system in some way, and who are committed to pursuing higher education as a, a vehicle for social mobility. And uh, the link is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have also a wide range of programs that include uh, the Career Pathways and um, the Fellowships Program, which Jamila will talk about. Yeah, so we have a Pinkerton Fellowship for undergraduate students. We offer them internship opportunities anywhere from 12 to 15 months where they're able to intern at an organization that provides uh, justice, juvenile justice involvement uh, work. We offer uh, a stipend of 12,000, up to $12,750 for that particular fellowship program. We also have the Tau Advocacy Policy Fellowship here where we work with graduate students, where we offer them um, not only assistance with their tuition, when they're in the fellowship program, but we also offer a stipend of $2,000. These students uh, that are graduate students are working with uh, internship organizations as interns that are focused on policy advocacy. So they're really great opportunities. Uh, the only thing is that with the Pinkerton and Tau, you have to be a John Jay student to apply. However, we do have a David Rockefeller Fund Foundation opportunity. Here we offer a semester long internship opportunity at the David Rockefeller Foundation themselves. 
and you're able to work with the philanthropic and the criminal justice legal system world. Um, so it's a very interesting fellowship opportunities. You can go online and check out uh, our information that we have there. We also have a navigator certificate program. And here we have a 16 week semester long course where we work with those that are interested in entering the social service sector. So if you wanna help others and work within the social service sector, we offer a certificate program that will help you learn the tools you need to work within the sector. We offer this opportunity, opportunity to those who have ha been impacted by the criminal legal system, and you can find more information on that with the link provided below. And um, so in my role at the Institute, I am also, um, I'm the mentoring and alumni coordinator. Um, and uh, I host uh, the community advisory board. And what we have learned is, and I'm system impacted myself, right? Formerly incarcerated, that um, our folks are, are for a whole host of reasons, um, underemployed and unemployed and uh, tired, quite frankly, of trying to get a seat at somebody else's table. And, and the feedback that we've gotten from the community is that folks want to build their own table um, and start their own businesses, and which is why we've invited um, Ian to, to do this workshop. And so I'm going to turn it over to him. All right, thank you both so much. Uh, it's a fantastic partnership and a lot of programs that we're interested in supporting and, and hopefully uh, can direct folks who, uh, who could use those services uh, to you all. So uh, today, um, and start small, uh, myself being the financial program manager, have, uh, we've developed some content to talk about um, uh, uh, the kind of first steps of business planning. And uh, one of the things that we want to describe are the resources available to you. So Start Small is a, a nonprofit. Uh, we provide direct uh, services to small business owners um, uh, completely free of charge. So uh, general idea being that we, uh, we want to build the communities that small businesses uh, are, are so important to, to, uh, uh, if, to have a part of uh, as these communities, in these communities. Um, I'm gonna kind of quickly go through some of these slides just so you see a general idea of who it is that we support. Um, uh, we, uh, being that we're providing uh, free services, we ultimately want to leverage those where they're most useful. Uh, places where there might not be resources or uh, uh, history or uh, network of resources to help build these businesses. Um, the uh, services that we're delivering uh, come through either the legal marketing and sales program or the financial program. Um, there are a number of different topics that we can touch on in any of these uh, uh, teams uh, that's primarily provided through volunteers. So uh, we have staff like myself, full-time staff who can uh, provide direct assistance, but we always try to connect you to industry experts on any of the specific topics that you may need assistance with. Now, workshops like today's uh, is available or, or these are available to uh, anyone who joins, um, but for full services from all three teams as you need them, one-on-one uh, -on -one service, direct, uh, direct technical assistance, that does require uh, some degree of eligibility confirmation. So we do have applications for you to put in your information uh, about what you're doing with your business, uh, uh, where, uh, what your background is, uh, what you could use help with. And uh, if we're able to provide you those services, it will essentially become a full-time uh, client. Um, so all this information will be in the slides. You can look through in more detail. Uh, we have uh, English language application as well as a Spanish language application. And, staff support uh, for folks who are either uh, monolingual or if you're directing this to someone um, who could uh, use assistance in Spanish language, we do have uh, support there. So uh, one of the uh, conditions that I wanted to mention here is that we only provide uh, full client services to the business owners who've already gotten started. So we have this uh, kind of entry uh, uh, gate of at least $500 of sales in the last three to six months. Um, so our organization's really not uh, set up to kind of field business idea stage uh, uh, questions. Uh, there's plenty of other organizations out there or uh, uh, um, government agencies 
uh, like the Small Business Administration and their local uh, counterparts who might be a good fit for general idea uh, business planning. Uh, but most of our services are going to be once you've tested the market uh, and got a good sense of what you directly need help with. Uh, that's where we're going to be best situated to assist. However, we uh, realize that this can be um, a, a big barrier getting just uh, over the hump from zero to sales, zero to capital. Um, so uh, a workshop like today's is really taking the lessons we've learned from working with uh, uh, already operating businesses and, uh, and trying to share that information with folks who uh, might not have gotten started yet. Um, and uh, you'll hear me refer several times to our actual name because the name of the organization is not just the name, it really is our uh, uh, teaching method. Uh, we suggest that you get started. Uh, you get started on something small and you build over time. So uh, you'll hear me keep referring to that. And a lot of the ideas we'll talk about today are going to be uh, directly um, uh, along those, those lines. So in today's workshop, there's really kind of two main pieces that I want to talk about. First is around, around really defining your business or your idea. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about uh, the ideas about competition, which I think a lot of folks don't like talking about. Um, but it's a really, really important way to start getting some of the information that's going to be really helpful for you in either uh, identifying those first sales or markets that you want to sell to uh, or raising capital um, and then uh, kind of breaking down specific goals uh, so that we can really analyze if things are working or not. You might have something that sounds like a very good idea to you or to others, uh, but the only way to really uh, find out if it's going to work is to test it out. So uh, it's a fairly simple idea about goal setting, um, but there are some specifics, especially around business finance, like a break-even calculation that I'm going to introduce today and hopefully uh, allow you to, to kind of do on your own. Uh, and then we'll talk about the data that you can track as you are testing things out. What kind of infrastructure pieces will help you track this data, whether that's technology or just some considerations. Um, uh, banking and bookkeeping, I'll just very briefly mention, but it, you're, you'll find through this discussion about tracking uh, your goals or, or tracking your operations against your goals, that this makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna mention a bunch of different data points that you can use to analyze whether things are working or not, or if you need to make changes. So there's going to be a lot of content in here that you don't need to uh, fully retain the first time you hear it. These slides in this recording will be shared out and other resources will be shared as well. Uh, today's main goal is to kind of identify what uh, you should be considering and, uh, and get started on some next steps. So if you do open up the slides, um, you will see in the speaker notes of, uh, of this, there is a, a, a brief or, or a very simple um, worksheet if you wanted to kind of follow along and start answering some of these questions for yourself. Um, so you can download a worksheet uh, that's accessible um, through the slides, uh, but it's just one of many different forms. All right, so uh, before we get into the actual forms of what that business plan uh, or, or what your next steps might look like, I want to kind of uh, rift a Band-Aid off on one of the most uncomfortable conversations. For folks who, uh, as mentioned, feel like they have a really unique idea, uh, something that no one's ever done before, it can be difficult to start identifying who is doing something similar. Maybe that's not the uh, phrasing that you wanna use, uh, but the general idea about identifying how folks are already spending their money is going to be uh, critical for you to be able to really identify what your business does uniquely uh, and to be able to uh, raise interest either from your market or from folks who have uh, money who you want to invest or lend uh, to your business so that you can get started. So the one example I have on the image uh, 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 or in the image on the left, this actually comes directly from a pitch deck that Airbnb used in uh, the early 2000s. So for folks who remember what uh, renting hotel rooms or uh, single night or weekend stays uh, looked like, before Airbnb was an app on your phone, there were not many options uh, or the options that you did have were either directly uh, things like uh, um, hotels.com or uh, uh, something as, as kind of odd as, as Craigslist. 
Airbnb was not scared of mentioning uh, these competitors. Now, Airbnb is a very disruptive business or was a very disruptive business, totally changed uh, what these kind of short-term rentals look like. And it's even affected the housing market in general. Um, but even back then, they did not feel a need to say that they were so unique and so different that they couldn't be compared to anybody else. What they did was develop this matrix where they have one axis of uh, whether these transactions are offline or online and another axis of whether these things are expensive or affordable. And then they found their unique place among uh, this matrix. Right? So the different, uh, what you use for the different axes, totally up to you. That's gonna be based on what kind of business you're running. Um, but you really do wanna figure out what is it that makes your business unique from others um, the idea of you know someone coming up with a, or inventing a new color, it's going to be very hard to explain what that color looks like if you're not using references to things that people already know. Right? It can still be something that shares a unique spot along uh, these axes, but giving some reference points can be really helpful. The other kind of uh, language that you often see here uh, in defining this value proposition is this desire versus exclusivity. Right. It's just another example of different ways for you to try to compare what your unique business is going to offer compared to uh, uh, what's already out there, how folks are already spending their money. So as we start to uh, put these ideas together, um, you're probably or you may have heard of a specific phrase like a business plan. And the question might be, what, what is this? Is there one form of business plan? There's really not. You can find an infinite number of different templates and formats for uh, different business plans. And there's uh, none of those that are inherently right or wrong. Uh, the first question you need to ask is just what is this for? Right? Are you doing this because uh, is this, are you writing this stuff down into a business plan because you have a competition you're trying to enter? Are you trying to submit this business plan to a lender so you can get money? or are you just putting it down for yourself so you can start to identify uh, what your goals are, what your next steps are. All of those are totally legitimate reasons to uh, develop a business plan, but they might shift uh, what format you want to put it all down into. A competition or a lender might have a very specific format that they need from you, um, but other folks might not wanna see a 30 page text uh, based template. Um, so uh, that question comes up around uh, uh, the format versus the actual function of it. If you're trying to quickly convince someone of you, the value of your business, you don't want them to have to read a bunch of text um, or uh, you need to convince them before you ask them to read a bunch of text. So in those cases, searching for a business plan template might not be as helpful as searching for a pitch deck template. Pitch deck is just another word for slideshow. Um, but you would be uh, asking for a specific thing or you'd be pitching a specific thing. So you can, uh, whether that's Google or Bing or anything else you're searching with online, you can just type in business plan template, pitch deck template, and you can find a whole bunch of these uh, and, and compare which ones actually are, are helping you uh, achieve what you want with that business plan. Now, as you're doing uh, these business plans, whether it's a pitch deck or a text-based plan, um, there's really kind of two frameworks that you need to be considering uh, both parts of. Uh, one of those is the more near, near uh, term, these short term goals, things that you actually uh, can accomplish, um, can kind of prove uh, about the business, and these longer term visions. I think a lot of folks at the kind of idea stage can spend way too much time just focusing on the long-term vision uh, that this business this could become the next Google or Apple or whatever it is. Um, uh, that's all great. And you want to record all those ideas, um, but they need to be uh, uh, shown along a timeline of we're going to get to X, Y, and Z before we get to this longer-term vision, right? It makes it more realistic for someone to understand what the, what the long-term vision is. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're just focused on the next couple of months or years or next steps, uh, you might lose uh, the opportunity to convince folks of, uh, of, of a bigger uh, uh, success or, or profit that they can uh, get from it. 
One thing I want to mention here uh, for folks who have um, some ideas of uh, businesses that are maybe more along the lines of these uh, uh, disruptive tech companies like Google, Facebook, or uh, um, something along, or, or uh, uh, Tesla, or even uh, um, uh, Airbnb. Um, these are often referred to as, uh, as unicorns. Um, so this phrase, uh, uh, it doesn't have an exact definition, but in financing and kind of startup uh, uh, culture, um, they're talking about businesses that uh, grow to huge degrees, right? Scale up and become an everyday part of, uh, of folks' lives, either across the country or across the world. Um, and the reason they're, uh, they use the phrase unicorn here is because of how rare they are. Right? Unbelievably rare that any company ever becomes a Google, Apple, or whatever else it is. Um, the thing about most of those businesses is that they don't need to prove profitability. Right? So uh, uh, you can uh, even today look at uh, companies like Uber and see that they are roughly billion dollar businesses or Tesla, billion dollar businesses, and they uh, never have been profitable. They lose money all the time. The only reason they're able to continue to lose money for decades and still have billions of dollars coming in is because they have investors instead of profitable customers. This is a model that is extremely difficult to guide anyone through. As mentioned, uh, it's super, super rare that people with billions and millions of dollars are going to, uh, uh, for one thing, even invest in any business idea. And the ones that they do invest in, whether it sustains and actually becomes uh, you know, a publicly traded company or an actually operational uh, business, it's totally different questions, right? So, what we're going to talk mostly about, because this is the majority of businesses and small businesses, is, is, uh, is to focus on sustainable profit, right? That your business has a strong model, it makes more money than it loses, and you're able to pay out investors, uh, other partners, other owners, employees, whatever it is, and continue to grow your business over time. Uh, I'll mention a few of the things as we go through the slides that are kind of related to these equity-backed unicorns. Um, but uh, for the most part, this is going to be information about how to grow a sustainable business. Um, the other thing I want to mention for folks who might be confused about this uh, language equity, when we're talking about financing, this is the idea that someone has given you money without a promise of you paying them back. Now, a loan is, uh, has an actual guarantee with it. Right? If they give you money, you're going to either pay them back that money or you're gonna pay them back that money plus interest. Right? So this is a lot easier to convince folks of. With equity, you need to be able to convince them that there's some long-term huge profit uh, potential that's worth the risk of them maybe never getting uh, their money back. All right? So the general idea uh, about being able to access equity really comes down to negotiation and persuasion. There's not some set uh, 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 equation that's going to prove to somebody that your business is worth um, investing millions or billions of dollars in and that you're going to become one of these uh, unicorns. Uh, it's really uh, something that, that uh, depends on who your audience is. So you need to consider that over time, but we can prepare, right? The most, uh, we can help you prepare to become the most competitive pitcher uh, that you can be. And uh, that would typically involve like something like a, a loan package where we have these three different pieces. So if you go to a bank and you ask for a business loan, they are probably going to ask for these three things. One is historical financials right, to show that the business has been operating for two years. And this is how the business is done. It's typically like a profit and loss statement, maybe your other financial statements. Um, uh, so that comes from bookkeeping or accounting. Uh, if you have that, it shows what the business has already done, it's the past. Then uh, financial projections. So this shows the future. Uh, you'll typically be asked for like three to five years of projections. This is trying to uh, illustrate or convince to the lender that there is a, a strong potential for this business to not just continue what it has done, but to grow and grow in a way that will allow the business owner to pay back uh, the loan. And all of this needs to get tied together into some kind of narrative. And that's either going to be the text-based business plan, 
or the more visual and text combined pitch deck. Um, so uh, ideally you're preparing all three of these things before you go ask for money, uh, but every business is gonna be slightly different, right? So uh, we're gonna keep talking about these things as we go through the slides. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll try to make sure there's, there's time for, for questions at the end. Um, all right, so the next uh, uh, slide here, I, I've got a title that I think I referred to before. Zero to one is a common phrase and the general idea being that if I don't have anything going on in business. How do I get to one sale? How do I get to one investor? Um, and it's really a, a question um, uh, for each business owner to identify what is their one. What is that next stage? For many of us, we really have to ask the question, do I even want this to be a business? Is this something that I just am passionate about and I don't want to involve this idea of profitability and money into it, right? Hobbies can be something that either uh, don't cost you anything or uh, just cost a little bit. Uh, you might be volunteering with them. You might find employment in them. Um, so uh, there's, uh, all sorts of options for just how you can live your lifestyle in a way that uh, matters to you. Um, but if you can turn it into a business so that you're not spending time uh, in ways that you don't want to, great. We want to help you uh, realize that dream uh, as much as we possibly can, as close to your dream as we possibly can. So first question is always just going to be, what do you actually want to do? Right? If you're doing something for 40 hours a week that you don't like doing, that you don't want to do, you're probably not going to be very good at it. And vice versa, there might be things that you're very good at, and just because you're good at them, you might enjoy doing them more. So it's a really simple idea, but it's important to ask yourself about it. Uh, don't want to get into a business that you hate doing, you end up running poorly, you end up losing money on, you end up uh, missing out on opportunities to do something that you would be very good at, that we would be able to earn a lot of money from. Next question, especially I would say for kind of service-based businesses or for folks who are uh, really trying to disrupt some industry is, uh, is a question about if people are actually paying for this thing, All right? So uh, if you are trying to, um, uh, let's say, uh, publish a, an online magazine, um, are you paying for online magazines? This often comes up with uh, uh, in like uh, creative writing classes. Question is, how come I didn't get published in this creative writing uh, magazine? And the teacher asks, well, do you read creative writing magazines, right? If you're not on the other end of it, if you don't understand that there, uh, if you haven't seen both sides of the market, the seller and the consumer of it, the first question is, is there even a market for it, right? So uh, it might be a place where you are going to create a market that no one's ever touched before, but I would say that's super rare. And in general, folks don't want to pay more money than they're already paying. Uh, so in some way, you have to convince everyone who's spending money at the extent that they want to spend money to either stop spending money in that way and start spending it uh, on you, or to start adding to their budget money that they've never spent before, which is, I would say, a much harder sell. So if we're at least identifying these competitors that you may have, uh, as mentioned in the matrix with the Airbnb uh, comparison um, or whatever kind of comparison that's helpful for you, uh, you can start to see how folks are spending money and what's going uh, to drive them to spend money on you. So SWOT is something you might be familiar in a number of different ways. It stands for uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, uh, um, and I'm actually forgetting what the T is, uh, but um, uh, you can fill out these little charts and, uh, and they can allow you to, to kind of start plotting on a matrix along those lines of uh, 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 what's different from your business uh, and, and the businesses that already exist. So there's a link there if you follow along in the slides. Uh, as mentioned, people need to spend money for you to be able to uh, earn money for this to be a real business. So we need to do analysis of who those folks are. Where do you find them? Uh, why are they going to pay you? How much are they going to pay you? Now, in some cases, I would say uh, for a lot of service-based businesses, kind of human services uh, businesses, you might not want to charge the folks you're serving, 
right? So uh, if we talk about re-entry services, folks have been impacted by the criminal justice system, uh, to charge them money might be to add more barriers to their life, right? It might be conflicting um, the uh, uh, kind of success you want to uh, help them achieve. So the question is, do other folks pay for your target market to receive those services? And this is often the case with uh, kind of government uh, uh, procurement, the idea of the government purchasing services or goods. Um, this is an opportunity for you to uh, deliver services to folks who either can't afford or don't want to pay for the services that you are providing. Um, so you can actually look through government data, either at the federal, state, or city uh, level, and find out how um, government contracting has occurred in the past, you can see what kinds of contracts uh, uh, get paid for by the government, what kind of bids are open, um, and where there might be demand, and how many folks are actually um, uh, uh, competing uh, for these proposals. Um, so there's a lot of information you can get from that kind of uh, uh, government uh, uh, procurement, uh, government contracting data. And, uh, and as mentioned, uh, pricing, right? So. This might sound like a simple idea, but it is really crucial. Um, if there are folks who uh, have extra money, they're at some point that they don't wanna spend any more of that money, right? It's always gonna be easier to convince someone to buy something that costs less money. But on the other end, you might find folks who uh, are uh, uh, enchanted by some dollar amount. There's a number of different factors. I do have a slide that we're going to talk specifically about some of those considerations. But it's really important to kind of identify this idea of how much are you actually charging? What's the value of your hour, of your uh, uh, thing you're selling, your sales unit? Um, all those things we want to talk about and specifically how that compares to your market. All right. So once you're tying all that together, either in pitch deck um, or a, a business plan, right? You've, you've identified all these different things and, uh, and you can now concisely, easily, quickly pitch uh, what your business is and why it's unique and why someone should either invest in it, buy from you, partner with you, whatever else uh, that is that you're thinking. Now, uh, this is one place where I'll again mention the kind of unicorns, folks who uh, have some huge vision that they aren't able to get started on their own. Well, in that case, you're probably going to uh, need to at least uh, get some type of either prototype or this what's referred to as a minimum viable product. There's an article here from SCORE if you want to read through different considerations there and different kind of worksheets. Um, so once you have all these ideas ready um, and they're put down and you can pitch it, this might be the time to either get that prototype or that MVP ready and, uh, and start asking for financing or start asking for financing and capital so that you can get to this point. For the rest of us, for the actual small businesses that make up most of the market, we need to just start selling. We need to test out what we have. We're either gonna be selling these services and uh, um, see if folks will pay uh, what we thought, uh, what we hoped they would, or sell uh, products um, that we uh, uh, wanna see if folks actually need and need enough to pay the prices that we need them to. So, uh, there's a number of different resources here. I, I link Start Small, our marketing and sales team has put together a number of links with worksheets and resources. Uh, if you're really unsure of how do I just get started, um, there's a whole bunch of different ways. Most important thing is that you do just get started. Um, so you can look through those resources if helpful, if you're really kind of stuck. Um, uh, uh, but otherwise, you can start with family and friends. There's probably some immediate market around you that does not require you to spend a lot of money to be able to start seeing if there's interest, maybe getting feedback, maybe getting reviews on a website or social media, um, and, and just getting your feet wet uh, in this idea of, of I, I now have a business. So there's a whole bunch of other considerations I'll kind of briefly link through uh, that you might be worried about in terms of Am I legally protected? All that sort of stuff really needs to come after the idea of I've got a business here. I've got a business here that people are interested in. Um, I would say family and friends is often not enough to prove that this business is going to work. They might be a little more charitable or uh, generous than 
the uh, market that you need is going to be, but it's still somewhere to get started. Um, and, uh, and the next thing you need to do is to set a clear goal. Okay? We need to be able to say at the end of some point, did this work? Did it not work? If it didn't work, uh, what can I start to change? A lot of folks have an idea about a business, either never get started or once they get started, they never kind of evaluate whether it's working or not. And then they just continue to spend a bunch of time on something that's not working. If we can early on identify that the goals are not getting achieved, we have a much better chance of being able to adapt the business in a way that allows you to actually achieve what you want. Right? So uh, in there, you'll see uh, SMART goals, another uh, uh, acronym, uh, uh, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, uh, um, uh, timely. Yeah. Uh, there's a, an article in there. All right. So once you get started, that question of, is this actually working? The easiest way to tell that is going to be through your financial performance. All right. So uh, uh, we're going to talk a bit about this. I'm not going to over, I'm, I'm going to try not to uh, overload you with uh, financial terminology or anything, but this is unquestionably the clearest way to see if things are working or not. Are you making money, right? That's a real business, makes money. Um, so you need to have that idea of goals in mind so that we can really tell. Uh, so whatever that next stage is gonna be. Um, and sorry, I see John, did you wanna hop in? Yeah, so I guess the question that comes to mind and probably on the mind of everybody else is, is there like an easy formula for valuation? So like how, so how do you come to, um, I have a widget um, that I think is going to, you know, be successful in the market. And how do I come to a price point that is going to uh, be profitable, right? Because that's going to determine whether or not I have a business. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, which, places you start at is going to be dependent on, uh, 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 it's going to vary for each of the uh, uh, business owners or folks with the ideas. Um, but this is essentially what I'm suggesting is to first make sure you have identified some way that it can, uh, uh, that it can cover the costs. So this, uh, this idea of identifying what the expenses are, if you've already got this idea of what the widget is, you need to find out how much it's going to cost you. Once you identify what it's going to cost you, then you at least have some floor for what you need to sell it at, right? So this is an idea of either the gross profit margin, right? That your unit selling price covers the costs of that unit. Um, uh, that's kind of the first step you absolutely are going to need to find out. Uh, but then there's going to be other costs involved that might take time. Um, so this is going to be a trial and error thing for any business. Uh, um, the most important thing is, is really to just pick a starting point somewhere. If you've identified what that widget is, okay, how do you actually pay for that stuff? What is that going to cost? And if you're looking at uh, competitors, you might be able to figure out ways that uh, they are paying for their products, with putting together their products. Um, uh, it, it really does just, just depend. Valuation, uh, that specific phrase is something a little larger. The, so we're typically, uh, in, in terms of valuation, we're, we're typically talking about how much is this whole business worth? Um, and that involves a whole lot of projections uh, and different uh, research that you're doing in the market. It's really only something that you need to do when you're trying to raise equity investments. Um, because you would be giving them a portion of ownership and you need to know what that portion of ownership is, is worth. Um, so I'm not going to talk about valuation today. We have, uh, we have other workshops and uh, videos that do get into uh, that information. So if, uh, if, if, that's, if that's a question on anyone's mind, you should either reach out to Start Small and become a client or look through uh, videos, which, uh, which we'll, we'll send in the, in the recording um, uh, this week. Does that seem fair? Um, so yeah, the, uh, uh, this idea of now starting to put together the numbers, this break-even analysis, I would say is super important to just get started. If you're not this business, that's going to only live off of billionaires investments, but you're actually going to sell products and, and they need to make money, um, or sell services and they need to make money. 
uh, you need to make sure that you can actually cover those uh, expenses. It's really not a difficult equation. This is going to be the, the question, this break-even point. It's going to be a, a volume of sales. How many sales do I need to be able to cover the fixed cost in my business if I'm selling for a certain price, uh, a unit for a certain price that costs a certain amount? So in these next slides, I'm going to break this down even further. All right. That first thing of identifying what your actual sales unit is can be tricky for folks who either have service businesses or even if you're a food business, but you do catering jobs instead of uh, uh, packaged food products can be confusing. If it's straightforward, great. I sell chocolate chip cookies. I sell two of them at a time and that package is worth, uh, uh, I'm going to price that or I'm just going to test it out uh, at $2.50. For other folks, you might want to start with some time bound uh, parameters or sales units. You might say, this job is going to take me one hour. So for one hour, I want to see what would the business look like if I charge $45 per hour. However, you might have experienced some past jobs. You might have just done some for family and friends, and that's given you a sense of, how, of what's involved in that type of job. So you might just take a job like the Smith job from last year. You might say that had not the, it wasn't the most difficult. Uh, it wasn't even the second most difficult. It was the third most difficult job that I had. So I'm going to put that in some tier three pricing. Right? The whole idea here is to just start putting numbers down. And we need to have as uh, defined of parameters as we can. What are these inputs that we're talking about? When I make one sale, what is that thing that I'm selling? It's either an hour, a job. Uh, a number of muffins, cookies, whatever else, all right? From there, we now have to break down that sales unit. Now for service-based businesses, it might not seem like you're paying for anything when you make that sale. If you're just picking up the phone and talking for an hour, then it, whether you make a hundred calls or zero calls, you're not paying for anything unique. Um, uh, the things you're paying for, you'd pay for with the zero calls or a hundred calls. But for other folks, you're either gonna have to pay for ingredients based on each package of cookies and you need to calculate that out for every two dollars and fifty cents that i sell how much does it actually cost to just make that sale and right, so where uh, these are referred to as either direct costs variable costs or your cost of goods sold um, and even for service-based businesses you might have these if you're let's say paying for commission you have you're having someone else deliver the service so every time you make a sale, you pay someone 40% of that sale. That's a direct cost. We need to identify what that cost is going to be. Um, uh, there's a number of other things that might occur every time you make a sale. We want those numbers distinct. Those are gonna be really helpful for us to project and plan what's gonna happen when the business grows, All right? So the next step is not going to be, um, the step three, these expenses are not changing every time you make a sale, right? These are referred to as your uh, fixed costs or your operating expenses. These are things you might be paying for either monthly, every month I pay for this subscription, uh, uh, I pay for this membership for storage, I pay for this subscription service for email or QuickBooks, um, but maybe every year I pay for hosting or insurance. And then every season I pay for these things. Ideally, we want to figure out what these different uh, uh, periods are going to look like and what are going to be those either most expensive months. I typically say a month is the most helpful period because that's when these like recurring charges uh, occur. Or we might want to look at a full year. We might want to look at two, three years. Uh, as long as we have these numbers kind of laid out, we'll be able to make a bunch of different decisions um, and see things really clearly. These three steps, these three inputs, are all you need to do a, a break-even analysis, right? At this point, you would then divide this total number, right? So in this case, the uh, either if you're doing an annual one, this 400, uh, I'm sorry, four thousand five hundred thirteen dollars of total operating expenses, these fixed costs in the year, and we would be dividing that by whatever our gross profit, otherwise known as contribution margin, uh, right? The difference between our price per unit and our total cost per unit. And that would tell us how many sales of this $1.53 uh, gross profit we need to cover the $4,500. And then 
if that's a reasonable volume of sales, uh, you can just go out, try to achieve it. Hopefully you get there. If not, you can make some small changes. But if you find out that this is totally unreasonable, I could never sell 10,000 cookies in a, a month, then you need to reevaluate, right? So then you go back to the drawing board. What are my prices? Can I increase them? And then it'll be a lower volume. Uh, can I find different uh, costs or ingredients that won't cost as much? So that smaller volume of sales will cover these expenses. There's a whole bunch of different decisions you can make at that point. Um, but as long as you do this calculation, you'll have some numbers to make decisions about. And you'll see if it's really way unreasonable or potentially something worth trying out. This idea around pricing, um, if you either go read CNBC or watch CNBC or, or uh, uh, read some blogs, You'll find folks who say your price should be, uh, you know, 30% above what your costs are. Maybe, um, but I think it's much more important for each individual business to figure this out themselves. Um, like I said, the break-even uh, uh, calculation will give you at least a floor, but I definitely can't sell below this price because it'll take too many sales to cover all my expenses. Um, but uh, your general idea or the next questions you're going to be asking yourself, can I either increase the prices or should I increase the prices or should I lower the prices? Now, uh, in general, you want to, or for you know, a capitalist business, uh, you want to increase the prices as much as you possibly can. You want to make as much money as you can. But at some point, people will not pay for your service or your product at a certain price. Uh, you will likely not know what that price is until you test it out. So this idea of A and B testing is either taking one price uh, and giving that a test one month, one week, uh, having another price, uh, the B test, uh, and seeing if the same group of folks in the same circumstances are more willing to pay price A or price B. Uh, sales are always going to be more informative than surveys or research. Uh, so you really want to test this stuff out as quickly as you can. Um, but some of the things to uh, consider is that some products, very few products, uh, where you can just increase the prices and have uh, uh, folks continue to buy at the same volume. Right? So we talk about like oil and gas, uh, you can increase those prices and folks are still gonna fill up their car because they need to get to work or wherever else they're going. Most small businesses uh, uh, do have sensitive or elastic pricing where if they increase their prices, less people will buy it. So something to consider. Uh, and then in terms of lowering prices, right? We, for one thing, we gotta make sure you're covering costs, um, but you might be trying to increase your market share right, by uh, having more folks buy from you um, uh, instead of your competitors. Lowering your prices might help you do that, but then you might get yourself in a competition with your uh, competitors for lower and lower prices. You might get to a point where you're uh, out of business because you can't afford the low prices that your competitor can. Maybe at some point down in the uh, uh, road, um, maybe for holidays, you want to be able to offer a discount. You don't want to lower your prices so much that you not now have no room to uh, offer a discount. Um, so just a couple of things to consider. Uh, I'm not giving you direct answers here. These are considerations for you and your specific business. Now, uh, once you've come up with these ideas, you figured out what the test you want to run is, and you've made sales and it seems to be working, right? The market has been proven. That's where you're gonna get involved in these infrastructure, uh, uh, legal or, uh, yeah, really just infrastructure pieces, whether that's legal, marketing or, or finance. Um, there are some cases where the business you're running is so risky or uh, so complicated that you need to do this legal stuff first. And that might be the case. I would say it's a very small minority of the small business ideas that we uh, uh, talk to folks about um, are, are in that group. For most folks, you just want to get started, prove this business has potential, and then start adding this stuff in. That's when you get insurance. Maybe you get an entity that limits your liability, like an LLC or a corporation. Um, uh, you start collecting data right, about your sales, about your customers, whatever else that is. So it's going to be either bookkeeping and financial management, banking. You get a website and you've got a point of sale system and analytics are coming in. And then, uh, you know, along the lines of this liability limitation, you might start uh, uh, coming up with a, a name for your business that you want to put on websites, logos, whatever else you have. 
uh, you ultimately are going to need to search to see if other folks are using that. Uh, and when you uh, find out no one else is, you're going to file uh, to be an entity that's doing business as, that's what this DBA is, doing business as this name, uh, an employer identification number. So you have a, a, a formal taxpayer, this entity might be distinct from you, you get a separate business bank account. So all the numbers are in one place and you can really see what's going on in the business. And then depending on your industry, you might need licenses or permits, at least just registering the business with the state. Um, if you're selling products, you might need to collect sales tax on top of the state, right? So all these things, you don't need to know all about them right now. Uh, as mentioned, we wanna prove the market first and then you can start working through these different considerations. This is all stuff Start Small can help with, um, uh, but there's you know, plenty of, uh, of resources out there as well. And then the question is, what's the next step? And you're really just going to keep reiterating uh, these tests. You come up with a goal and you test it out. After you, your test parameters, you review what actually occurred. Right? So you're going to review things like your bank statements, your bookkeeping systems, your point of sale systems, your websites. And you're going to see if this is not working, what can I change? What did work? What can I maximize about what's working? All right. So. I have slides in here about things like your business bank account. I'm not going to spend time on them, though. We have other workshops that go into detail on financial management. But if you're curious, you can look through. Um, point of sale systems, I would say, if you're not yet started, you can have, uh, if you're not yet started using uh, banking accounts and uh, bookkeeping systems, you can at least start tracking those early sales. You want to get as much data as you can and point of sale systems. You don't have to always swipe cards to use them. You can just use them as an electronic register where data is getting recorded free. Bookkeeping systems, Wave is a free one. QuickBooks, are every, uh, a lot of folks know about, and it's great, but it's paid, but there is a free option out there. Right? So if this is something you're really interested in, you can just get started doing a free bookkeeping. Um, but if you know you want to pay for it, services that like QuickBooks offers, if these things are valuable to you and they're worth the cost, great. It's recording important data that's going to be useful when you're uh, analyzing whether this business is working or whether you need to make changes. Um, in, uh, once we get to that point, you've tracked this data after your uh, um, uh, uh, test period, there's a whole bunch of different stuff you can consider. This might feel overwhelming and there's a bunch of jargon in here, but the general idea is just going to be, uh, is this proving success? Is there a part of this business that is uh, useful for me when I go pitch to an investor? Right? Is there a place where I want to lead off when I tell the story about what my business has done? Uh, so there's a number of different things that you can consider here. I'll just mention a few of them. Um, for one thing, I think it can be a little uh, confusing, this idea, this dif difference between growth and scale. Right? So uh, growth is generally just referring to the increase of sales. So if you're making more sales, um, more people are interested in your product or services, or they're uh, purchasing more of what you're selling, um, that's a good sign, shows the market is interested, but it might not be proving that the business is doing any better. Right? So if your expenses, this red line is growing at the same rate that your sales is growing, you're really just doing more work without getting any more benefit, at least at this point, right? There's no more profit in there. When you make a new sale, it doesn't uh, increase your take home at all. So the uh, scale that you see here, when the delta or the difference between your sales and your uh, expenses increases, that means your profit is increasing. It means you're making more money yourself, taking home more money uh, when the business makes more sales. So this is a really encouraging sign to see over time. Uh, and it's going to be really important if you're trying to bring in investors or do a profit share. They're going to want to see that the more money you put into the business, the more they can make. Something to look at uh, in addition to those kind of basic uh, profitability uh, data points we talked about, knowing at what point is my business going to be profitable. Uh, every profit margins, this idea of every time a dollar comes in, how much is actual profit? Uh, that's going to be a helpful number to talk about, whether that's with investors you're pitching to or just yourself to know. If you really do want to either get help with the math, do the math yourself, want to know what these numbers are. Um, cash flow can be a difficult thing for early stage businesses. 
Um, it might be, uh, it might not look great if you take on a bunch of debt, um, but your business itself doesn't have a bunch of assets uh, because in the case of your business, if uh, worst case scenario happens, business fails, you might need to sell all those assets. Will it cover the debt? If it doesn't look like uh, your assets will cover the debt, someone might not want to give you new uh, capital, either a loan or investment. But if you know this, then you can come up with a story. You can talk about why that is the case. There are other things related to cash flow, like you might make sales, but it takes a long time for you to get paid back. That's accounts receivable. You can come up with a metric, this thing called days of sales outstanding, DSO, uh, that says how long it takes for you to actually get paid. So even though there might not be cash in your bank account, there might be sales that are occurring and your business is doing really well. Similarly, if you're a product business and you end up purchasing a bunch of inventory, but you don't sell all that inventory, you can come up with a number that shows uh, how much in uh, inventory you've not sold on any given time. And then things like consumer behavior, right? This is really where we're trying to identify if what we're doing is working. Customer acquisition, right? Every time you get a new customer, how much did that cost you? Marketing or whatever else. Um, uh, this might take time to figure out what these numbers are, but if we can figure out that, let's say, uh, it costs you $1 to get a new customer, but that customer is uh, on average going to bring in $3 of profit, then you have this ratio, uh, $3 of uh, profit for every $1 of costs. That might be some ideal uh, proof to show that what you're doing in acquiring customers in your marketing is working. Right? Um, if it's too high, then maybe you can spend more and start to get more uh, sales at it's too low, you need to change what you're doing. Um, now, uh, a lot of folks talk about their social media. They say, I got a bunch of followers. Isn't, doesn't, isn't that great how, how good the business is doing? Question is, does uh, uh, do those volume metrics, right? How many people are following you? Does that actually turn into things like sales? Right? Always going to be, uh, sales is always going to be the golden thing to try to prove. But if not, uh, how many of those folks are actually engaging with your posts? How many of them are opening up uh, your website? On your website, how many uh, uh, links are they clicking? All of that uh, can identify a data point that can help you get more customers, get more investors, partners, whatever it is you're looking for, and prove to you whether things are working or not. All right, so uh, all this is really same idea. You identify that goal. You see if things are going along uh, uh, lines of that goal. Um, you track what's different, right? Week one might've paid for hundred dollars social media ads. Then week two, I stopped that and did 10% discounts. We wanna compare those things. We wanna see, is this actually turning into more sales or not? And you adjust what your goals are. If they're not working, you identify really clear cutoff points for these tests, right? So that you can allow yourself to actually change. You're holding yourself accountable not just, I'm gonna continue what I'm doing. Hopefully, you know, later on it'll work. We wanna test out different stuff. Um, so I'm not gonna go through these, but there's more uh, uh, metrics, phrases, things that you can be looking at that can help you understand whether, uh, whether your business is going the direction you want it to. All right, so that's really it. There are a number of ways for you, or that's really it for, for today's presentation. A um, number of ways for you to uh, engage with Start Small. We've got uh, webinars like this, and we've got a video library of recordings like this workshop. Um, there is a survey. So if you want to get through those numbers that we were talking about today, uh, really do a break-even analysis. We've got a survey here. for it's, uh, it's about 10 questions. And you can ask yourself, do I know my numbers? And is this business um, uh, going to help me? Uh, achieve, make money, be profitable. Um, and if not, uh, based on what your, your score on this survey, we'll send you resources or potentially an opportunity to work directly with uh, uh, Start Small staff. Um, we have a number of other resources uh, for you to check out, especially if, you're, uh, if you've been affected by COVID. Um, and you can also check out the different businesses that we serve and support small businesses across the country. Uh, one last program I wanna mention is that uh, New York State is, uh, is providing uh, grants to uh, qualifying businesses and Star Small Think Big is assisting with uh, both the application 
process and uh, sharing information about the program. So you can directly reach out to, uh, to us and we can help you figure out if uh, this program could fit for you and, and how to move forward with it. All right, so I uh, cut in a bit to uh, our, our time, but um, I can stay on for, uh, for questions if any, uh, if any come up. And uh, as mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll send out the recording and um, slides and additional resources, the links you've seen in this uh, presentation uh, uh, by the end of this week. And really want folks to feel free to reach out if you have questions either directly uh, uh, for myself or uh, Jamila or, or John. Um, we have, uh, uh, we'll be willing to share with you what we can and, and try to uh, assist you through it. You see a raised hand, let me open that up. Uh, Nathaniel, can you hear? Are you able to? Uh, yeah, yeah, you hear me, Ian? Yes, yes. Hey, uh, I appreciate your presentation, man. It was very uh, insightful and good things to hear. The resources are out there for people in my position. Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, I came up with some things um, on my spare time about starting a nonprofit myself. So this is good information to uh, to have for me. Uh, when I do get in the position that I need to uh, start it, and then I have, you know, some support through your uh, through your nonprofit to uh, assist me. You know, I just wanted to thank you for, uh, you know, sharing your knowledge of what you have to offer, man. Appreciate it. That's all I just wanted to share, just to thank you. Uh, and uh, you know, if it's another one that pops up, another one of these workshops, I'm definitely uh, encouraged to attend, learn more. That's awesome. Very, very much appreciate the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the words there, Nathaniel. And uh, there is on, at least on the Start Small Think Big website, you can sign up if you want to get email, uh, uh, emails about future um, events like this and other uh, resources. Um, uh, we'll, we'll include all that in the email we send out. I do want to say for, uh, unfortunately, that Start Small Think Big, we, uh, in terms of becoming a full client, we are limited um, to only four profit businesses. Now, if you haven't set up a structure yet for a nonprofit, then you're just a sole proprietor and we would be able to, to assist you. But ultimately some of those questions around like legal, uh, um, legal questions around your nonprofit structure, um, compliance, uh, uh, even some government contracting specifics, we might not be able to help with. So, you know, feel okay. free to reach out on any of those questions. I think all of this, the, the core idea about, you know, being able to bring in enough money, whether that's through government or other funders, um, to be able to pay for the things you want, that's not going to change between for-profit or not-for-profit, um, and uh, uh, hopefully it's, it's useful, but uh, um, we'll be able to, you know, point folks in different directions if we can't help ourselves. Yeah, and Nathaniel, we will have a, a workshop on November 17th on nonprofits, but also if you're if you're working on your nonprofit now, we can uh, refer you to Legal Aid Society, and they'll provide mm -hmm. you technical assistance with this. Okay, I'm I'm also glad to kind of um, to connect with you, Nathaniel. I mean, so it's really interesting. A lot of our students um, and people in our community are looking at five hundred one c threes. And there, there's a thing called a 501c4 um, that is not as restrictive. It doesn't allow you to get government grants, but it does allow you to kind of make a profit. And if you are kind of the sole owner, then then you just you're just paying yourself and putting that money back in, into your business. Um, and there, it's just a small distinction between a non-for-profit and a not-for-profit. Um, and that's something that's kind of a structural issue that people need to take a look at. And I don't think that a lot of people know that. Okay. Thank you. So floor's open for any more questions. Uh, if I don't hear them, I'll still, I'll stay on the line for a couple more minutes, but um, uh, otherwise really appreciate everyone joining today and uh, I look forward to working with you all more. 
I think you be a logo. Yeah, you're getting lots of um, lots of praise there, Ian. Very kind. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording now. As mentioned, I'll stay on just for a couple more minutes. You feel free to log off if you're uh, uh, done for the day.